Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You throw a few people in costumes and they excite you, get the grows. You think it would be in the kids, but it's not in the kids, it's in the big people. Then I can sleep. Alright, can you, Rob, can you hear me? Because I'm about to shout at someone. Morning, morning. There we go, there we go. It's dark out there, you must understand. I can't see too much of you guys there. But uh, if you can call the guys in, Devin, Devin, call the guys in from the coffee shop, we would love to get started. So I'm going to start this morning with a simple prayer. So why don't you stand with me, we're going to pray, and, uh, and there's no religious act in terms of the standing with me, but I just want to help get ourselves focused and ready and in a position where we are going to move for God. We, we were in a, in a prayer meeting, Graham shared, us, shared with us this picture of uh, a team pushing a bobsled, and you know with a bobsled it's on ice and it's a downhill, but to get that bobsled moving they have to push it. Uh, the guys in the bobsled team have to push the bobsled, it picks up momentum and when it gets to a point where they're about to fall off their feet, they have to jump inside quickly and then they go down the hill. And, uh, and the fact that you are here this morning doesn't actually mean that you are pushing your bobsled. It means that you're here and you're in the, you're in the, the maybe you're even a spectator. But this morning there's something that God wants of you and it's not to just be a spectator but to be a participant. It's, it's to get yourself active in terms of walking with God and what He has for us this morning. And it is quite possible that what God has for us is going to come through you. And so I'm going to ask you to not just be spectators but this morning be ready. Ask God. Ask Him now. What is it God? What is it that you want me to bring? And, uh, and whatever that thing is, bring it with faith. Make some faith to it and, uh, and bring it. And that might be in the service, it might be after the service, it might be a message to someone after, whatever that is. So, now we can pray. So Father God, we do thank you for this incredible privilege of being able to get together as your sons and your daughters, those who are lavishly loved by you. We thank you God for your presence here. We thank you that where your word tells us two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of us, God, we know, we, we experience you here together as friends and as family, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. And, uh, and we celebrate that this morning. This is a celebration day where we honor you and we praise you. So I pray, Holy Spirit, would you lead us through? Would you guide us in this process of living well and meeting well for you? That we will not be spectators, but we'll be those who have activated our spirits, activated our hearts as we come to you to do the very thing that you've called us to this morning. May our gifts and our talents be used well today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, after that exhausting prayer, you can sit here. Thank you. All right, so the announcements. I'm going to start with... Is there anyone on the announcements table at the back there? Oh, Tiana, sorry, I can't see you in the dark. All right, so we're going to start with the family day feedback. So it was last week, was it not? We had a family day, so we've got some, some photographs up there. Is there music? Do I have to dance? I can sing. Dance? Yeah, clearly you don't know me. Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, that was the music as well. Sing, that was it. I hope there's one of the briars. There's about three of us briars. <laughs> In the rain, outside, under the, under the shelter there. Anyway, we had a great time. There was an incredible buzz in the coffee shop and uh, and we are going to be doing it again at some stage. Come on. Next week. No. Soon. Soon. Okay, that's a non committal answer. I apologize for that. Then, um, Diana, the Moms and Tots slide. So every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there is, uh, sorry, not Moms and Tots, Moms and Little Ones. So this, based on the picture, is for very little ones. And, uh, and so babies, Jane, I think 
Jane is outside? Is she yeah. outside? Are you in here, Jane? No, outside. Okay, okay. Well, there's a color. Color is her husband. And, uh, and what she's asking is that if you have recently given birth and, uh, and you want to be a part of a group of ladies who have common interests and common challenges and delights, then uh, there's a group that you can meet with and it happens on a Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Feel free to contact her. As I said, colors at the back there if you need some kind of guiding towards Jane. Then, the parenting course. This, this is, a, is an important one. I, I think one of the biggest challenges we have at the moment as parents is we are growing up in a world that's different to when we grew up. It is a different way of living. Our kids have a different mindset. And, uh, and so we need something of, of the wisdom of God. And, uh, and this, this uh, empowering parenting is going to be exactly that. They're going to share something of an insight into the thinking and the ways of, uh, of the young people at the moment. And, uh, and there is a cost attached to it. It's on the 29th and on the 30th of October, uh, which is next weekend. And uh, there's 50 rand for you to be there, but it will be a valuable investment. If you are about to have kids going into teenage years, it will be incredibly valuable and helpful for you to understand something of the process of what they're going to walk through and then how to be them in there. Right, the Sunday School Club. Thank you, Tina.
Then uh, one of the other things that we have is we have Rich and Zelda who are leaving the church and they are at the moment in Grahamstown. They're at a church in Grahamstown uh, with Dave Cock and I've asked Sid if he would come up. And I've asked Sid specifically because Sid has and lives this thing of the apostolic. He's, he, he's got it on his heart and so I'm going to ask him to pray for them this morning. Father, we just thank you for the wonderful opportunity that Richard and Zelda have to go to Grahamstown and to encourage Dave and Kate and the church there, Lord. And we just pray for your anointing, for the freedom of your spirit, Lord, for your power to come, and for that church to be encouraged, built up, and strengthened. So, Lord, we just pray for the, um, the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to flow into the lives of the people that are there, that they truly may grow and develop and become what you have called them to be. Yes. Lord, we ask for that, and we ask for miracles, signs and wonders to take place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so there's one announcement that I've left out. Actually, there's two. What is it? We've got welcome this morning. No one. No one. You would think you'd start with that, but uh, apparently I have not. So, if you are here for the first time, we want to welcome you this morning. Uh, if your visitors are there, any? can we? Uh, okay, it's a bit dark. Um, I see some victims, some people uh, who have come. It's great to have you guys with us. And you know what? Our hearts are with you this morning is that you would find God. So, yes, you're meeting with us, and we're going to invite you to the coffee shop afterwards, but. But that you experience something of God's love and His, and His, His incredible presence. Uh, that's what our prayer is for you this morning. And then having said that, if you go out through those doors there and turn right, there's a little coffee and, coffee and tea center there where we have our best people who are going to meet with you this morning. And this morning it is Marius and Christina. I take it back. It's not our best. It's the best of the best of the best. So they're going to be there. They're going to host you. So if you're able to, if you've got time, it would be great that we can meet with you guys. And uh, again, God bless you guys. Let's, let's worship. Let's worship and honor God as best we can.
with desire and expectation. And the Pope Lord said, if you desire me, I will come. But you need to lay down your expectations. Because I will work the way I want to work. So can we lay our expectations down today and just desire the Lord? We desire Him, but we have we put expectations on Him. So if we just let go of ourselves and say, Lord, come and do what you want to do today.
they put it into practice. So this is the first time for both of them. So let's give them a nice applause. Do the Slubber family have any other children? <laughs> Do you want more children? Because we can prophesy, we can... <laughs> well, good morning, church. I feel like being simple today. No complicated message. Um, I felt that there is power in just the simplicity of the Word of God. So I'm hoping to do something that is powerful, but practical and simple this morning. And uh, as Bruce said, it was just such a wonderful treat to, to have an entire family on stage and to have, there's something amazing happening in the, in the music team um, the, and it's being led by the, by the younger guys. And uh, before practice, I got here, Fidian and Warren were practicing songs that they'd written on Saturdays, they're coming to play. Um, Brett is young at heart, he's leading the charge. Um, but it's just so wonderful to see the body, uh, the Bible uses an analogy of a body, like an arm and a leg uh, that makes up an entire body. But uh, another wonderful analogy is that of a team. Um, the bass can't do what the drums are doing, and the keyboard can't do what the violin is doing. And when we all bring our sound, as Bruce was talking this morning, it makes just the most amazing melody. So you've got a unique sound to bring and a unique role to play. And I trust that God will lead you into that. Um, so the, the heading of my message is called Game Changer. And very quickly, in 30 seconds, I want to paint a picture of where we are as a, as a church, as a band or as a body. Um, there's moments in a band when you rise to a crescendo and there's times when you drop out and you're quiet, but you do it together as a band. If we all go quiet and the drummer's smashing away, um, he's kind of on his own. Um, so as, as, a, as a church, as a people, as a congregation, we have these different seasons that we go through. And uh, the first sort of season we went through was when, when COVID hit and we went into lockdown, we just felt an emphasis on your personal relationship with God, being able to dig wells for yourselves because we were so separate. And, and the, the theme was kind of look at me. Look at what's happening in my relationship with God. Learn to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. And then we began to go out of that stage and we went from look at me to look at us. And the talk was about us corporately and that we're not just alone, but we're part of the body. And we feel that now the emphasis is not, it's gone from look at me to look at us to look at them. And that the emphasis is coming for us as a people to look outside of these four walls, to look at those that God is bringing across our paths, to look at the lost, to look at the hurting, to look at those who need Jesus. And we've read about the, the mission that we've been given and the ministry. The Bible says that all of us are ministers of reconciliation. What a wonderful thing. No matter what you are, before you're a doctor, before you're an electrician, you are a minister. And your job is to reconcile those who are lost from the Father to the Father. So I want to paint a picture. So everything that I speak of this morning, think of it in the context of this season that we're in, where we're focusing on others. Um, so there's this amazing moment called the Day of Pentecost. And I want to paint a bit of a picture for you. We have the whole of human history is leading up to this moment. You have creation, and then you have the fall of man, and then you have God redeeming this people called Israel. And there's all of these pictures that are pointing to Jesus who is coming. And then we have this moment, this amazing moment where Jesus steps into the scene. It's like, yay, Jesus is here. And then he dies. Oh, he was here. Now he's died. And then he raises again. Yes, he's here. And then he goes away. Like, oh, come on. You were just, yeah. We just um, got to spend some time with you. Now you've gone again. But Jesus says, I'm, I'm, um, it's better for you that I go because I'm leaving the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving the Comforter who's going to reveal all things for you. So this whole course of human history is led up to the stage and now the disciples are told by Jesus just to wait. And they're going like, what is going to happen now? It's like the whole of human history is hinged on this moment, has brought us to this moment. And what happens is um, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost and He falls like tongues of fire, like that song that we were singing. And um, 
stuff starts happening and people start paying attention. So much so that, that uh, we see in Acts 2 verses 36 to 41 that Peter stands up and he begins to preach and he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You know that your preaching, well, at the point of your preaching has hit home when the response from the people hearing is, my goodness, what must I do? Tell me what to do. I've been cut to the heart. And this is what Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So what does it take to get one person saved? What does it take to get 3,000 people saved? To reconcile 3,000 people in a day with their Heavenly Father. It takes two things and that's what we see. is It takes the Word takes the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes down at Pentecost and God starts moving, people start paying attention. The first thing that Peter does is he gets up and he quotes from Joel and he quotes from the Psalms. And as he reads the Word, as he preaches the Word, together with the Spirit, all of these people get saved. So I want to talk a bit about the power of the Word this morning. We want to see the Word and the Spirit in action as they saw on the day of Pentecost. So you may have heard this, um, trying to think, what do you call it when you have like a word, like W-O-R-D and W means something, O means something, acronym, there we go. So you may have heard this acronym, you may have even used this acronym, but who, have, who has heard of an acronym for Bible, B-R-B-L-E? What does it say for? Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Who's ever heard of that before? Who's ever said that before? Yeah, you can wish to put your hands down. I'm going to tell you why, in my humble opinion, that is an absolute terrible description of what the Word of God is. So the first reason why it's terrible is the second part says it's instructions before you leave earth. But in Matthew 24 verse 35 it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord our God endures forever. When you and me are gone, and when heaven and earth is gone, God's word will still endure. And we know in part that one day we will understand the fullness of God's word. So one day when we pass on, the word will be more relevant even than it is to us at the moment. So it is not just before you leave earth. And the second thing is that it is not basic instructions. It is not an instruction manual. It is not a scientific textbook. There is no frequently asked questions section at the back. There's no um, thing that you can look up, oh, I have a, a, a problem with my, with my um, neighbor who made my lawnmower and won't give it back. What is the specific words I need to say to him to get that thing back? It is not an instruction, it's not a list of do's and don'ts. What the Bible is, is it is simply an invitation to revelation. And I want to explain to you a way that is that when you read the Bible, you read it in a fresh light. You read it as an invitation to a revelation and not as an instruction book of do's and of don'ts. So I'm going to play a game with you guys this morning. This is my analogy. It's not a perfect analogy of how you should read the Bible. So bear with me. The point of this game is that you need to work out what the rules of the game are. So only I know what the rules of the game are. And in, in this, so if you're confused, that's great, because then the game is working. Um, so this is how the game works. I'm going to make up an, an imaginary party. And it's my party, and I'm inviting you. And you have to bring something with you. And if I like what you bring, you can come to the party. If I don't like what you bring, you are kicked out of the party and you have to stay home. So you have to try and work out what it is that is a good thing to bring to the party. So this is how it's going to start. I'm going to say my name and I'm going to say what I'm going to bring. And then I've prepped one or two people to respond and maybe you will get the hang of it. You've got to try and work out what the game is. 
So my name is Graham, I'm having a party, and I am bringing an elephant. Where's Chanel? Uh, you can just shout, shout for you. Like. My name is Chanel, and I'm bringing an egg. Chanel, and she's bringing an egg. Well done, you can come to my party. Ray, where's Ray? Ray. Ray, what are you bringing? No, you cannot come to my party. You sit down, sir. Get <laughs> you out. Carla, what are you bringing? My name is Carla. I'm bringing an anaconda. An anaconda. Uh, that is cool. You can come to my party. Tim, Tim doesn't know how the rules work, so let's ask him. Tim, what are you bringing to my party? My name is Tim, and I bring the cake. No, you cannot come to the party. <laughs> Does anyone else want to try? Anyone think they've worked out what it is? Got to work out the rules of the game. Yes, sir. Shout out your name and what you're bringing. Uh, you're bringing your heart. You're bringing your heart. No. <laughs> okay, so if you would have worked it out, what you need to do, they play this game at least sometimes. My name ended with an E, so I brought something with an E. So if you catch on, Bruce, his name ends with an E. Ray's name ended with a Y, so you needed to bring, I don't know, anything that starts with a Y. You need to bring your yellow egg. So I'm sure some of you have watched a sports game where you have no idea what's going on. But the more you watch, you kind of work out what is happening. So uh, I'll give you a quick story. I went away with 25 other pastors who lead, a, lead churches. And they have this tradition of going away that's been happening for years and years and years. And they play a card game. And they sit in a circle. And there's a king and a queen, and you basically move down the hierarchy until the guy right at the end is like the dunce. And you don't want to be the dunce. And they play until they reach a certain time. And then the loser, if you're dunce at that time, you have to drink a glass of something that the king makes. So that day, they played the game. They ended at like 10 o'clock at night. And at about 5 in the morning, someone had caught a fish. So the king took the eyeballs of the fish. <laughs> And he squeezed the apples with beetroot and with the most disgusting Tabasco sauce. And if you were the loser, that's what you had to, you had to drink this, this glass of this stuff. So I knew nothing of these rules. And the second last round, and the round goes quite quickly, I walked past and I said, hey, do you want to join us? Come and play. So I said, I have no idea how the rules work. So they said, not we'll catch on. And I sat second to the last person. And by the absolute grace and mercy, of God. I uh, managed to catch on how the game worked and I managed to do well enough to come second last. And I didn't have to, I didn't know the rules that you had to drink that thing at the end. I didn't know how the game worked. But you see, the way that we read the Bible is we have front row seats to how life works. We see, we watch how creation works. The, the Bible isn't a textbook. What it gives you is it gives you the lives of people. You get to read about Moses. How did Moses play the game? How did David play the game? How did Jesus play the game? How did Jesus interact with the Pharisees? How did he interact with God and the Holy Spirit and with the disciples? And how did he interact with the lost? And as you watch this out play in front of you, you've got to discern what are the rules of the game? How does this thing work? And that's how we read the Bible, not as a, as a, as a list of do's and don'ts, but we're working out, we're seeing life out played before us. Um, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8, it says, uh, the heading is Christ crucified, it's God's power and wisdom. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Every four years the Olympics comes along and they generally have some sport in there that you've never ever heard of, you would never ever watch if it was up to you. And in the, the Winter Olympics there's a game called curling. They take like a big block of, it looks like a cheese wheel, and they, they push it on the ice and then you see the guy has two mates who, who rub the ice, sweep the ice in front of him. Have you guys ever seen that? And they've got to try and get it to stop. The first time I saw that, I thought, in the history of mankind, a stupid game has not been invented. 
It's foolishness because you don't understand the rules. It's pointless. It's the, I can't believe grown men have dedicated their lives and I have to watch this on TV. And then you begin to watch and you hear the commentators begin to explain and you see the reaction on the people. And five hours later, it is the greatest game you have ever witnessed in your life. You can't believe that you've never heard of or never seen this. And that's why when people look at Christianity, they look at the game, it looks like foolishness because it doesn't make sense. Because they are playing the wrong game. You know, they are saying, look at how many points I have. I have the highest score. Look at all the things I've done and accomplished. My score is really high. And then you say, hey, but we're actually playing golf. And the guy with the highest score is the loser. We are playing a different game. We are playing as a kingdom um, economy. There's a kingdom that God is building. There's a spiritual realm. There's things that people don't see. And what it takes in 1 Corinthians um, 2 verse 12 to uh, 14 it says, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with spiritual words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers their foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. We need the Spirit and the Word. Our job is to preach the Word and we trust for the Spirit. The Spirit is almost like that commentator who reveals the game to us, who shows us what is going on. Without the Spirit, we don't have any idea of what is going on. That's why in Hebrews 4 verse 12 it says the Word of God is alive and active. It's not. There's, there's a terrible testimony of young men who are filled with passion and love for God who go to theological seminaries to study the Word of God and they study it in this power. They study it like it's a textbook and what happens is they lose the influence and the revelation of the Spirit and it becomes simply knowledge to them. So I want to share quickly with you some inside insights that, that I get to have. Um, a few years ago, I, I think I spent two years working in an estates department. Um, and what that means is that when someone passes away, we wind up and administer their estates. And what a good sound. Um, and, and, and what happened is when I got to go through everyone's estates, they were all very wealthy people that had passed away. So I got to see what wealthy people invest their money in. And I began, began to see some patterns that all the wealthy people who passed away invested in the same shares, in the same companies, at the same proportions and the same ratios. Um, and, and I had some insight insight because I could see what was going on behind the scenes. And as now someone who works full-time in the church and in a pastoral role, I have some inside insights into the lives of people. I get to see people at their best. I get to see people at their worst. I get to see a large volume and a number of people and how they live their lives. And these are some characteristics that I've seen of many <laughs> Now I have this fear that's going to happen again. Okay. I thought that's what they were to do. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Let's just carry on. It seems to be working. If it does that again, I'll just talk without the mouth. Um, so there are a few characteristics of men and women who, as David said, um, David said, I hid your word in my heart in Psalm 119 verse 11. So these are some things that you can expect from people who hide the word of God in their heart and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal His word to them. Um, you will get guidance from the word in, in Psalm 119 verse 105. It says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One of the things and characteristics I see in people who don't have the word inside their hearts is they live their lives like water flowing down the side of a hill. And it just takes the easiest um, path of least resistance. 
So if it's easier to do something, I'm just going to go this way. And what happens to that stream is that stream doesn't determine where it wants to end. That stream just goes wherever the road takes it. But if you are, uh, find yourself in the Word of God, if you hide yourself in the Word of God and you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal and give you revelation from the Word of God, your life, your feet will be on the right path and you will end up where you want to go. So the first one is guidance. The second one is freedom. Psalm 119 verse 9. It says, How can a young man stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? It is the word of God revealed by the Spirit. Sometimes we try absolutely everything to get free except reading the word of God and allowing the Spirit of God to reveal himself through it. Number three, those people are shielded. Psalm 18 verse 30 says, As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. And what I've seen is, is that people who are in the word of God, it's not like they get spared the difficulties of life, but it doesn't knock them. They don't stay down for long. They are like shielded from the, the something of the, the harshness of the realities of life. Number four, they are fruitful. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. It says, All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. <coughs> if you are found in the Word of God, it, you, your life will begin to bear fruit because you will be equipped. To do the things that God has called you to do. And the last one is nourished. Matthew 4 verse 4. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. People who live their lives in the word of God are nourished. Their souls are nourished. They have a contentment. They have a joy. They have a peace. There is a st stability to their lives that you just do not get if you are outside the word of God. At our last 3B meeting, I had this picture in my mind as we worshipped. And you can actually put the picture picture up. <coughs> and if you can see that, you often get these signs that say, men at work. And I just saw this picture that said, God at work. And um, what I felt was that we needed to allow God to complete the work that He did. What we need is revelation. 
And there's two um, amazing accounts in the, in the, in the Bible. It's not going to be too much longer. And the one is of Job, and the other one is of the prophet Habakkuk. And both of them are similar. Both of them have these burning questions inside of them of why. And I don't know if you've ever experienced in life where you've had that question of why that like burns deep inside of you. Like, God, I need to know why did this happen? Why does this happen? Why does this continue to happen? Why, God, why? And we see Job, and Job, I always forget how long it is. It's 42 chapters. And they set the scene in the first like two or three chapters of Job. He gets his, his family gets taken away. He's, um, he loses all his wealth. He gets sick. His friends come in and um, accuse him of things. His wife shouts at him. All of these things happen to Job. And then there's like 40 chapters of Job just, just asking God why. And then eventually God comes to answer him. And you think finally we're going to get the answer to the question. And what God does is He doesn't give him an explanation. He reveals Himself to Job. And He says to Job, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? And the incredible thing is in both Job and Habakkuk, the answer is enough for both of them. The answer, imagine the, the biggest questions that you have. Imagine meeting a God or meeting God in such a way that those questions that you have just melt away. I actually wrote this, I'm going to read it. I said, just imagine someone so wonderful that when you encounter them, your deepest, most burning questions are either answered or simply melt away. That's what we have to offer the world. How magnificent must our God be? That no matter how burning those questions are within you, that when you have a revelation of who God is, and when you meet Him, you go, actually, God, that stuff is not important. And the question that I ask myself is, why is it enough? For you, would it be enough? Because when I read Job on his behalf, I go, man, I would still want to answer to those questions. Why is it enough? And there's a, a, a short little statement from the Westminster Catechism that says, The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So when you read the Word of God and you, and you want to understand what are the rules of this game, and you read Job and you read Habakkuk, and you understand that oh, one of the rules of this game is that if I find Jesus, it will be enough. If I have a revelation of who God is, that is all I will ever need. All of my questions will melt and fall away in just the light of His glory and His grace. And God will either reveal the answers through the Word, all those questions will just cease to be so pressing on your heart. Why? Because it's the chief aim of man who reads the pinnacle. Nothing else matters when you have a revelation of who God is and how wonderful He is. So I said I want this to be a simple, practical message this morning. My encouragement for you is that this week, go take a book of the Bible, or go find a character of the Bible, and read it not as an instruction manual, but ask the Holy Spirit to reveal something about the rules of the game to you. Watch the read about, um, or maybe Job's a bit heavy, heavy reading, go read John, that's, that's always encouraging. Uh, but find, find a, a character, find a book of the Bible, and just read it and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, to smooth the road out before you. And the more we do that, the closer we get to that stage where there's no roadworks needed anymore. And we can just ride as God has smoothed the way for us into the purposes and the plans and the destiny. And as we read the Word of God and, and the, the Holy Spirit reveals things to us, we see that we have a Father. And we see that He is good. And we see that He has a plan. And we see that He has given us a purpose. And when we see all of those things, we want the same things for our brothers and our sisters out there who have not experienced that. So it's up to us to be game changers in the lives of the people that we meet. To take the revelation that we get from the Word of, the, of God. And when you share revelation, and you're not just sharing knowledge, that is when the, the Spirit begins to move and begins to work in the people that we are ministering to. So this thing I know, and I'm not discounting 
that many of us have got complicated questions, have got difficult solutions. And I'm telling you now that God will either answer them or He will bring you to a place of satisfaction where you can live like Job and Habakkuk with peace. Both Job and Habakkuk end with both of those men praising God. Just lost in wonder at the awe and wonder and splendor of God. Living in peace. Having all the depths of the hard questions just answered and finding satisfaction. And that's what we want for everyone, to find a place of satisfaction in the wonderful God that we serve. So let's go out there, let's be game changers. It's not complicated this week. Just read your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Himself to you. Cool. Let's stand up. Father, we thank you that you are so wonderful. We thank you that you reveal the mysteries of the universe to us through your word. You reveal yourself, Father, your nature, your character, how good you are. And Lord, I pray that as we go into this week, for every single person who opens the word of God and prays the prayer, Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to me through the pages of your word. I pray, Father, that you would answer that prayer. I pray that you would speak so clearly, Father. I pray that peace would come, Father. I pray that your, your, your presence would be with us, revealing your word to us. And we pray, Father, that we would be men and women who are fruitful, that our paths would be lit by the word of God, and that we would find ourselves hidden in the word of God. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless your word to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>